You're now listening to episode 54 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costello here today with Mark Henteman, executive producer and screenwriter for the popular animated series Family Guy. He is also a longtime real estate investor, having invested in the Los Angeles market for the last 20 years. Today, he's looking to expand outside of the LA market and into the world of syndication. In this episode, we discuss how Mark got started in real estate, investing in Los Angeles, recession-proof assets, how he handles accounting and taxes, plus much more. Even at halfway through the year, it's not too late to start tax planning for 2019 and the years ahead. Our Tax Strategy Foundation Engagement is a multiple call series that walks you through the tax strategies you'll need to minimize your tax bills. At the end of the series, we'll give you a tax strategy blueprint that summarizes each strategy and what actions you'll need to take to implement them. And if you need assistance throughout the year, our team is there to help you every step of the way. There's no need to pay more taxes than necessary. Head over to therealestatecpa.com and fill out the form on the Become a Client page to get started today. And without further ado, let's jump right into today's episode. Hey, Mark, thanks for coming on the show today. Can you give our listeners a little bit of information about your background and where you are today? Yeah, I started investing in real estate in 2000. I was a struggling, had been a struggling, uh, aspiring writer and uh, had been broke for a while and, and had student debt. And when I got my first traction in writing, I got, you know, I worked for David Letterman and then started on a new show called Family Guy back in 2000. And, you know, nobody on our staff thought the show was necessarily going to go on for very long. So with my first script payments, I was committed to uh, achieving some kind of financial security. So I ended up uh, buying a duplex and I figured it could be a good hedge against the uncertainties of the entertainment business. And, uh, you know, I kind of, I caught a good time in the market and enjoyed it very much. And I fixed it up and uh, eventually sold it for, you know, kind of a ridiculous um, multiple. I, you know, I was able to put a 10% down on my first, because it was my first uh, purchase. And uh, I ended up selling the property. I bought it for $435,000, put 10% down, which was 43500 and sold it for one27 million five years later. And, uh, you know, I had $800,000 in gain, which was about 2000%. And, uh, you know, I had been reading about real estate. I really enjoyed being a real estate investor while I was doing it. And I was, I was kind of trying to educate myself on what I didn't know, which was a whole lot, but I had read about some tax approaches to real estate. And when we sold my wife, uh, she was my wife, at the time. No, yeah, she was my wife at the time. Uh, <laughs> when we sold, we did the uh, married couple exemption for 500000 on our side of the duplex. And then next door was uh, the other, was our renter. And we 1031 exchanged that. So pretty much, uh, you know, 500000 of our 800000 gain was tax free. And the other three hundred was 1031 exchanged into, you know, more multifamily. And I, by that time, I was completely hooked. I was like, this is the best thing ever. And I was going to do it until I was a hundred. Got it. So, you know, out of all the investment opportunities that, you know, are available to you, what was it specifically about real estate that attracted you? Yeah, I think I didn't choose real estate. Real estate kind of chose me. I had been through, you know, student debt and uh, being penniless, trying to break into, you know, this thing that I wanted to do. And so I was really committed to, to something. And I, you know, I was thinking that real estate, I appreciated the physical nature of real estate. I trusted real estate. It's a physical asset and it's land and it's not going anywhere. There were a lot of reasons where I saw that as valuable. I could see the value in that. And then I just needed to learn. You're currently involved in a lot of different real estate deals and assets. How do you manage that with your writing for Family Guy and any other show that you're on? Yeah, it's uh, sometimes, you know, my worlds collide, but most of the time I can manage it. I have a third-party property management and I like 
shifting gears coming home from spending all day in the world of abstract ideas and trying to figure out jokes and script, you know, structures, and then, you know, just looking at physical assets and, and there's something exciting about that. There's math. And that's like a great way to shift gears for me. It's actually relaxing. I've always found it really enjoyable, but yeah, you're right. I, I occasionally get into, you know, multiple transactions or value add and, you know, I have some weeks that are kind of intense. (laughs) <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about those transactions. What type of assets are you investing in today and why? What I'm investing in today, I continue to invest in uh, multifamily value add in up and coming neighborhoods in Los Angeles. The metrics that I favor are cost per square foot and cap rates. And what I specifically target is about a $250 square foot per square foot in LA, which is very much on the low side. Uh, and then about a five cap, which is, you know, a little better. It's kind of on the higher side. And if I can do that, what I'm doing is I'm buying these properties for about 50% of the cost to replace them. If you include cost of land in LA, and then I add value and, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm really protected uh, on my downside. I'm always looking to invest, you know, aggressively for the upside, but also very defensively on my downside. And that's kind of what I've been doing since the beginning. And, uh, you know, I rode through the 2008 crash and, uh, you know, that kind of reinforced, you know, that's where I want to be. B and C class value add. So we have clients all over the place and those that are in California, we see really low cap rates on the properties that they're purchasing. Typically they're trying to buy outside of the state because the real estate market's so hot. So why are you focused on LA? And have you ever thought about diversifying to markets outside of that geographic region? Yes, I actually, you know, maybe a few years ago, I decided that I I needed some diversification. I wanted, you know, some of these assets, I don't want to own 30 buildings, all of them in LA, and then, you know, we get hit by an earthquake or something. So I am now investing in Austin, Texas. You know, I did some research and wanted a growing market uh, with, you know, growing population, growing economy, you know, there was a lot a diverse economy. What's one thing that you do with your LA investments that kind of just make them work, you know, because again, going back to that, California real estate is expensive, right? I'm sure our, our New York City listeners are probably <laughs> listening a little bit harder here right now. So what, what yeah. are, what's like a strategy or a tip or something that you do to make those LA investments really work for you? You know, my LA investments have always worked great. And honestly, it was the it was kind of the pool that I learned to swim in back in 2000. I didn't know anything else. I lived here. I had some money to put down and I put it down on this duplex. And while I was owning this duplex, I was looking around across the street at the sixplex across and I was envious. I was like, God, God, it would be so much better to have six units than two units. And I I knew immediately that I wanted to grow. So I, I bought B and C class originally only because that's all I could afford. Couldn't touch the A-class product. But then after going through the 2008 downturn, I realized those are the best assets to be in. You know, LA, I, things that I like about LA, nobody mentions this, but the property taxes are very low. California ha- is notorious for high taxes, but it's income tax. So if you live in California, the best thing you could do is be a real estate investor because that the tax burden goes on professionals uh, earning incomes. You know, I started investing in Austin and it's the reverse. Uh, Texas is known for no taxes, but their uh, property taxes are at least double, maybe even triple of what they are in uh, California. Other things about Los Angeles, there's a chronic lack of supply. Uh, Los Angeles was ranked the number, the two most difficult markets to build in the US are Honolulu and Los Angeles. There's been a chronic lack of supply in LA, which puts a lot of pressure on uh, the values, and they're just not making uh, the the regulations and, and permitting is so difficult that the only thing that pencils out is A class luxury units, and so we have not an abundance, but we have more of those, and there's just not enough B and C class affordable housing to meet the demand, and so yeah, I've just been rolling with that, and uh, you know, for example, I closed. Uh, Earlier last week, 
on a building that I bought in, in 2012, a 20 unit building. And, uh, you know, just the numbers are great. The cash flow is pretty, you know, you can't always count on cash flow. There's not much of it, but appreciation is, is good. I mean, we've had a good run up the last seven years. I bought a building in 2012 that I sold last week. And, uh, you know, I was surprised at the number it fetched. It was, uh, I bought it for 2.9 million, put down 900,000, sold it for 7.475 and, uh, you know, six times my uh, down payment. Yeah, that's a pretty penny. And I remember we were talking at some point, you had mentioned that in LA, there's certain assets that you prefer to buy in a recession. I know some of them might be B and C class, but I think it was something along the lines of rent control. Would you be able to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, rent control um, and the regulations and restrictions are a lot of what drives people away from the LA market. But the reality is it creates these economic dislocations and a lot of it's out of whack. The pricing is out of whack. So it creates these opportunities if you know how to look for them. And you know you could often buy properties that uh, are at 50% of market rents and you can argue that you're going to purchase them based on rents. And then if you can get those rents up, I mean, there's huge, you can have rents jump $1,000 with one turnover. And then you can also offer, you know, you can make buyout offers to tenants and, you know, pay them $20,000 to move and the numbers kind of pencil out. And you'll find that a lot of people will accept that offer and you just got to know how to know how to navigate it. I guess it kind of sounds like you're you're buying the asset based on the actual in place numbers with the rent control. You're going in there and hoping that in some way, whether it be buying the tenant out or just natural turnover, that you're able to push the rents of that building. And because the nature of the rent control, it, it just I guess when you compare you you put in the cap rate to it, you know you're able to increase the value of that building quite significantly with just that little say thousand dollar rent bump. Yes. Yes. And that's one unit. And if you get a 20, do that across a 24 unit building or 30 unit building. That's intense. Um, so, you know, being around in the real estate game for about 20 years or so as an investor, do you have any, any words of wisdom or any experience that you could share that might be able to help people get through, say the next downturns? You know, a lot of people are thinking that we are closer to the top in general than we are the bottom. Yeah, I agree. You know, nobody knows when it's going to happen, but uh, you know, I, I think I've bought every building that I've ever bought, assuming that this thing I'm buying is going to endure a recession at some point. And I just want to make sure that I'm prepared for that. So I try to invest defensively. That's part of the reason I like to buy the product that I did. Like I said, I mean, it started that way just because those were the only things that I could afford. But there's a lot of value. You know, you're insulated in a way when you you know can buy at well below replacement cost and that's what i found uh you know i had a harrowing experience in 2008 uh 2007 8 it was the first time i had become basically an evangelist for real estate investing and i would talk about everybody in the writers room and people that i knew and they knew that i was had this like obsession with my side hustle of real estate but uh I got about five of my work colleagues to go in on a building with me. And I thought I was ready, ready to navigate the market as in like 2006, I'd stopped investing and I was going to wait until prices corrected. I knew something was coming. I was going to wait for the correction and then buy. And I had convinced some of my colleagues to go in. We had, there's five of us all together. And that happened in late Late 2007, maybe early 2008, the market slid about 10 to 15 percent, and I jumped in. I found this property that I liked, and we were in escrow. And right after removing contingencies in maybe early fall of 2008, uh, right after we removed contingencies, Lehman Brothers collapsed, followed by Bear Stearns in the whole world economy. And I was like, "Oh crap!" Like oh. <laughs> the first time I bring in all my smart ass colleagues to invest with me and I'm going to lose all their money <laughs> and I'm never going to hear the end of it. But, uh, you know, it wasn't fun, but I just kept doing what we did. We added some value. And to my surprise, as the headlines, the real estate headlines became grimmer and grimmer as there were foreclosures all across the U.S., I was seeing increases in my rents and we 
pretty much rode through unscathed and then, you know, sold a few years after the, uh, you know, I think we sold in 2015 and everybody tripled their money and, and I just breathed. <laughs> so, so you ended up being the smartest guy in the room then. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully they appreciated your brilliance. <laughs> I don't think they did. I don't think, you know, I think they were happy to get that return. I pointed out to them, I went and like tracked the dates of when we uh, bought and when we sold. And I think the stock market had returned like 48% during that time. And I, I made, made sure they were aware, like you guys got 299% return. Oh my goodness. That's like one of the best I told you so stories that I think I've heard <laughs> <laughs> in a good while. Very good. All right. So switching gears a bit, you have been involved with some different tax strategies. You've gotten some different tax advice from different CPAs, us included. What is the yeah. best tax advice that you've ever received in your opinion or your favorite tax strategy that you consistently use? Well, I'm still digesting all the good advice that uh, Thomas gave me yesterday. So I got to process all that. There's a, there's a lot <laughs> virtual high five for Tom. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I have to, I have to digest all that. There's probably some of the best advice I've gotten there. But you know, I think that uh, first duplex sale where I, you know, I actually asked my CPA if I could do this. Can I, can I take advantage of both the married uh, couple exemption and the 1031 exchange? And and they said, sure, we don't see any issue with that. I thought that was kind of a miracle when I did that. The other thing that I, I've gotten into in more recent years is cost segregation. And I find that to be pretty great, a favorite, one of the favorites of mine. So I actually want to talk about just real quick, the liquidation of that duplex that we'll call it house hacking, where you're living in one side and you're renting out the other side. So just to clarify, what you did is when you sold the property on the personal residence well, what you do is you allocate that sales price to personal use and then to rental use or business use. And on the personal allocation, you were able to exclude up to 500K of capital gains via the Section 121 exclusion, which is available to anybody that lives in a primary residence for the past two out of five years. But then you had the problem because you were renting out half of this property. You had the problem that you had a piece of the gain that you could not exclude through the Section 121 exclusion. So you 1031 exchanged it. Yes. Yeah, that's brilliant. And that works yeah. well for you. And it worked well. It worked well, you know, just by sheer luck is like we lived in kind of the owner's unit. They were kind of identical mirror side-by-side -side units, but I knew that we would sell this building to an owner user and I had to make it a very nice unit for them to live in. And so, you know, it had a nicer kitchen and some amenities that the next door didn't have. And it kind of worked out just by sheer random coincidence, you know, the exclusion was 500,000. We had $800,000 in gain and uh, it kind of fit that 500,000 could be justified for our side and then 3,000, 300,000 for the side next door. Awesome. How did it work going into closing, working with qualified intermediaries? Was anybody confused during the process? Like, did you, did you find that it's a relatively normal thing or were you having to explain it to everybody every step of the way? <laughs> No, I think I had one conversation where I called my CPA. I was already with kind of a big CPA firm out here that was primarily, you know, entertainment, but had a lot of business owners and a lot of real estate investors. But I talked to them and I said, hey, can I do this? I read about this. Can I do this? And they kind of did some research on their own and then came back to me and said, yeah, yeah, you can do this. We don't see why you wouldn't be able to do this. And then I can't remember, I, I've been using the same accommodator for at least 10 years. I can't remember if I used them on this exchange, but I remember it being pretty easy. You know, my escrows have been, knock on wood, mostly painless. Nice. nice. So 1031s, we love 1031 exchanges. We love cost segregation. Uh, but when it comes to the accounting side, you know, being a writer and, and juggling all these different things, I can't imagine that you're doing your own accounting or bookkeeping. How do you end up handling that? Do you outsource it, hire a bookkeeper in-house? How does that happen for you? Yeah, I... Uh, I have leaned on my property management company for a long time. They have a, a CPA in-house and they do a lot of it. And then they interact with my CPA firm. And, you know, a, a lot of, I'm CC'd on those emails and I am so happy to just watch them go back and forth between those two uh, CPAs and me not have to be too involved in it. But, uh, 
You know, I think I'm going to hire, and I have, I actually have a freelance bookkeeper working with me now who uh, also is a property manager on their own right. And they're helping with my books now. And I think I'll get more involved with that or, or let them. How important would you say that keeping those books and records like clean and up to date, how important is that to realizing you know, how much money you're paying in taxes or what tax strategies you may have to use to reduce your tax strategy at, at the end of the year? Yeah, I think it's huge. I think the clearer you can get on your numbers and the thing that I've learned possibly the hard way in some instances is you always have to manage your management company. And so, you know, over time, I've realized that I really want to see all the key performance indicators every month. I want to know, you know, what vacancy looks like, where rents are, how long, you know, units are being vacant, what they're re-renting them at, what the expenses are. The more of that I can digest, the more I can make informed decisions on, you know, how to move forward. Exactly. This is something that I think a lot of our clients need to realize at some point, some of our listeners as well, is that without clean books, without clean records, and I know I say this all the time on these podcasts, you know, it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, to give you accurate tax advice and ultimately reduce or minimize your tax liability because you know, it all comes down to the data that you have. And without good data, you know, you can't make those decisions. So it's good to hear that you're on top of it on that end. Um, when it comes to, say, your favorite mobile app or piece of technology that you're using for your real estate business currently, uh, what would you have to say that would be? <laughs> I think because you asked that question this week, I think it would have to be an app called Scannable. And I think it's somehow affiliated with Evernote. But I have a scanner in my office at home that uh, I don't want to bash them, but uh, it's an HP and I have a Mac computer uh, and there's always issues. I, there's so many times where I need to scan 20 pages of a contract and it, it won't scan it for some reason. I don't know why. So I finally found this, uh, this phone app and that has made my life so much easier. A hundred percent. You know, I, I just bought this printer and as I was shopping for the printer, I, shop, I bought a brother printer, which is the black and white printer. And I was like, you know what? I don't need the scanner portion because I can use one of these apps, like like the one you just had mentioned. And uh, I find the same thing always happens whenever I buy a printer, no matter what printer I buy, no matter how much I pay for it, there's always something that goes wrong with the printer. So if you can just get one thing off that printer's plate and you could have the app that does the scanning, all, all the more power to you, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, I heard you were getting into the syndication game a little bit. You know, so what, what type of assets are you targeting on the syndication side of the game? And what would be the best way for our listeners to contact you? Primarily, the assets that I've been buying is those properties that are big value adds. You know, I've been investing in a, a pocket of LA called Koreatown or Westlake, which is close to where I live and I know it very well. And it's rapidly growing. It's kind of feeding off the growth of uh, downtown LA. And I've found a number of buildings there. And the other type of asset that's fun for me is, uh, you know, LA's got these great historic properties. And sometimes like I, I talk to other real estate investors across the country and they're like, how could you invest in a 1920s building? Like I'll, I'll invest in 1920s or 1930s buildings. And I, I like to restore them. And some of the architecture is really cool and I'll brand them. And, uh, you know, I just bought one, one of my syndications that I did. It, it kind of looked like a castle. It looked a little bit like the Chateau Marmont, if you've ever seen that, but it was kind of in disrepair and we're, we're restoring it and rebranding it. And that's fun for me. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the type of assets that I've, I've been, uh, buying with the syndications and they seem to be going well. And if, if anyone you know wants to reach out and find me you know, my website is Quantum Capital. Quantum Capital is the company that I set up maybe four years ago. And uh, it's called quantumcapitalinc.com. Nice. So if anybody's interested in the LA area, LA syndications, well, then there you go. You got to connect. Yeah. And maybe I'll do some Austin. Uh, I, I have two properties in Austin, a 53 unit and a 71 unit that I'm acquiring. Yeah. And I'm excited about the, I, I like the Austin market a lot. I've liked it for a long time. And I'm, uh, you know, excited to be participating in that. Well, that's awesome. And, you know, Mark, we appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today. Before we wrap up, is there any final words of advice, any pieces of wisdom you'd like to impart on our audience? I would say, uh, yeah, just, uh, I think be defensive at this point. If you can be careful, 
you know, be be a little skeptical of of gurus uh, telling you that you'll be able to quit your job uh, in six months. Uh, I that wasn't the case. I, I don't know if that's the case anywhere, but uh, you know, I don't know. Real estate is a job too. <laughs> You're trading exactly. trading that job for real estate. It, it takes your focus, takes energy. You know, just instead of wanting to quit a job, you know, just find work that you love. And I really like writing. I also really enjoy real estate and have no desire to, you know, to quit either of those. No, it's great advice. Um, there's no free lunch, as they say. And uh, at the end of the day, you're going to be doing something, whether you're doing real estate or you're doing writing or you're doing whatever else anybody else does out there, as long as you love it, uh, that's all you could ask for. So thanks again, Mark, for coming on the show today. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.